refer to your host, uh, Susan Barger. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, everyone. Um, we're really pleased that you've stuck in with us this long. And uh, today we're going to have a really interesting webinar, as usual. Um, if you need to contact me, my email is here. And I just want to go over quickly, and we'll do it at the end, too. Um, I will need to have your assignments by November 26th if you're planning to get the Credly badge. So you need to do all your assignments, and you need to listen to all the webinars. There are a few people that have listened to the webinars but not done anything else. And I may send you an email just to ask you if you're in this for your own interest or if you want a Credly badge. So um, keep that in mind. And other than that, I'm going to turn this over to Mark Wemling, who's been who's the course coordinator. And uh, if you have any questions, put them in the general chat, and we'll collect them and make sure they get answered. So Mark, go ahead. Thank you, Susan. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce our today's speaker. Uh, Jamie Haskell has been a mountain maker for over 25 years working in major institutions and private collections across the western United States and Canada. He learned mount making while working at the University of Washington Burke Museum. And his further studies in conservation have contributed to this holistic philosophy of exhibit execution and collections care. At this point in his career, Jamie has been working on the education and training of a new generation of museum professionals to help replace the outgoing stream of senior staff all over. He conducts workshops at Mount Making Focus Studio in Seattle, as well as providing on-site instruction. I'd like to thank Jamie for joining us today. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Susan and Mike. Uh, I'm very honored to be part of this uh, process. Uh, Mount Making is a uh, Really, quite an interesting, uh, interesting craft. Uh, hard to kind of put it. We hard to call it an art or a craft. It's a bit of engineering. It's a bit of a bit of everything. But it has held my attention for 25 years plus. So the goals for this uh, webinar, I'm hoping to help you understand the purposes of mount making, and learn to conceptualize how a mount comes together and works for the object. Uh, and then we'll talk about materials and fabrication techniques commonly used to build mounts. Now, before we start, I just want to talk about one quick thing, and that is the subject of safety. And I bring this up because our Work is a difficult work, and we're doing really kind of things that don't have necessarily a, an easy or a straightforward way to do. And uh, so this order of priority, to me, is, is really pretty sacred. And that is that the first thing is that the safety of people is primary, whether those persons are building the exhibits uh, or those visiting them. People are our primary concern. The safety of the objects is the second concern. We are there to preserve the objects. This is about collections care. And so immediate and long-term object safety are both to be considered in our mount making. Uh, and then having the exhibit look great and get done on time is absolutely what we're after. But this has to remain subservient to the other two. Through good planning and design, we'll get it all done. OK, so what is mount making? Mount making is a preventive conservation practice, primarily, in my mind. It's a technique for enhancing the display of objects, really making things shine. Uh, if you think of a mask that is sitting straight up and down, looking straight forward, it's very static. But give that mask a little cock to the right and a little loom, and all of a sudden it has all the emotion that it would hold in the dance. So we are able, through proper mount making, to do things with the objects that give them 
the ability to tell their story better. And not making is really a thought process because we are solving problems of support and of balance to go along with the aesthetics. And we're doing this in the museum environment where we are really trying to make this all integrate into uh, a proper display. So what is a mount? A mount is a structure that's intended to supply appropriate support to an object and safely maintain it in that position. So this picture is of a very heavy native copper. Uh, this is at the Alaska State Museum in Juneau, where I worked a couple of years ago. They built a brand new museum. And if you get a chance, you go to Juneau and see it, because it is a fabulous museum. We wanted this to look like this mannequin figure was holding the, the copper up. But it is being held by a mount that goes to the back wall. But we built the mount in such a way that we were able to adjust the angle, give it a little off kilter to the back on the, on the proper right side, and a little uh, rotation to the proper right. And now it really looks like the figure is holding it. The essential concept of a mount, you're probably all sitting on a mount. There are some mounts that are better for short-term use and some that are better for long-term use. That's Victory Chicken, that is our mascot of our string band. <laughs> so what are the common purposes of a mount? We build mounts for a whole raft of different reasons. And there are different individual missions in each one. One is to stabilize a self-supporting object. This is at the Asian Art Museum in Seattle, or the original installation of the Asian Art Museum. This very large ceramic is very sturdy. It stands well on its own. But its base is fairly narrow. And we wanted to stabilize it. So here there's a plexiglass blade. There is bound to be some sort of either monofilament or a cable around the neck on that. And if you look at the very bottom, there's kind of a half moon that cradles the base of it so it can't roll away from that blade. The blade is then screwed down to the display surface. One is to display or float a structurally sound object you know, to make it fly. So this Tong Dynasty horse is, again, in good condition, but it's not something that you set on the deck. So we made a mount that lets it be in this great running position and gives it life. Sometimes it's to support a flexible or an unsound object. So this native headdress, which is at the Alaska State Museum, is made of red trade cloth and baleen and feathers. The trade cloth is totally floppy. It needed support. So this mount has a metal ring that is here. There are magnets that are on the interior. And then it has a strut coming up that supports, ah, there's the pointer, strut coming up that supports the baleen vertical that is uh, supporting the top knot of feathers. And so through the use of the mount, we're able to give this the support that it needs to be on display for a long time. And another is to be a structure to join and support unconnected, broken, or composite elements of the mount. So this Yupik whale mount has flippers and hands that were originally on the mask by pieces of quill. Uh, so at the base, connecting the flipper to the mask itself, there was a piece of probably duck or goose quill that uh, is connecting those pieces, but is not really very sound. So here we needed 
an actual structure to connect those pieces to the mainstay of the mask. And we use MOMS for seismic stabilization. This is, again, from the Asian Art Museum in Seattle. Uh, and this horse has a base and a set of legs that are very narrow. So they, if we tied the base down in a seismic event, it would break off at the ankles. So this mount goes up and inside through a large hole that is in the belly as a part of these pieces. And those black masses are large padded uh, inserts, and each goes in, one in the front, one in the back, and are tied together by the brass mount itself that comes down to the base plate. This controls the upper part, so in the event of a seismic event, it does not fall over. And it is gently tied all the way to the bottom, but again, should not break off at the legs. There are lots of different ways of doing seismic stabilization. This happens to be one we did. And then security is another issue that comes up again and again with mounts. In general, in my opinion, I don't like to feel that mounts are a security measure. They're not really a good substitute for appropriate security systems and oversight. Uh, retention mechanisms that are strong enough to keep an object from theft don't generally, we don't think of them as mounts. We will definitely use them, but uh, I, I like to think of a mount as being a little more for the, the previous purposes that I, I've uh, mentioned. Uh, so this is a good place to put the first pole in. So why don't you roll that in. So, Um, as we go on, we're going to be talking about the shape of objects. But so now I'd like to talk about what are the components of a mount. So generally in a mount, there's some sort of main structure that is kind of the main part of the mount. From there, we have retaining mechanisms that keep the object in place and will be what's taking weight possibly or maintaining it onto the, the main structure if that's what's taking weight. And then we'll have an attachment structure that comes down to whatever the, the display substrate is, the deck or back to the wall or whatever. So there's these kind of three, three bits to, uh, to most any mount. So then we like to talk about what are the missions of the mount? What is the mount trying to do? Well, the first mission really for the object is to provide support. And the level of support needs to be appropriate for the materials and conditions of the object. And this is especially important for things like basketry and hide and wood. Uh, a lot of wood isn't as sturdy as it necessarily seems. Uh, structurally uh, compromised objects where you've got either damage or, uh, you know, there's detached elements such as with the whale mass that need to be supported. When we're doing all this, we need to spread the load to accommodate the leverage and the balance that's part of the shape and the distribution of weight in the object. We would be in avoiding point loads, places where the weight is concentrated on, on one little point of contact. Um, we want to support the overall structure, make sure that we're kind of cradling the object. There are things that will do just fine with lower amounts of support, and there are things that need it. Uh, we'll choose those support locations to protect surfaces, we will be looking for friable surfaces or fugitive pigments or things like that. Edges that are damaged or, or sharp edges that we could get a concentration of uh, pressure on. And other damaged areas, cracks, uh, places where the object just isn't really as strong as we want. 
And we want the mount to help the object behave as a unit. We don't want to hold it at one end and the other end and connect to those pieces, uh, connect to the mounts by using the object. We don't really want to make it so that we apply stresses to the object in its mounting. So we're going to we're going to really try to work with that to help the object behave as a unit, and that's especially important in a seismic situation. We're using the mount to enhance stability, and this ceramic is the basic stability. It's a very narrow base, uh, and so we don't want the object to be able to start rocking if there's any sort of forces on it. We want it to just sit right there. And this is partly a seismic stabilization thing as well. And seismic is not only earthquakes, but seismic in the larger sense is ambient vibration. If there's trains going by, construction nearby, uh, carts rolling across the floor. And then there's errant human forces, as I'll refer to them, which I think of that as a eight-year-old child who's had a cookie and a Coke running into the exhibit furniture, uh, an errant floor buffer that's going back and forth and, and hits the, the pedestal. Those are all things that we're using the mount to stabilize and to hold on to it. Then there's an issue of visual stability. And objects that vibrate or move can make people uneasy. Uh, I was just in an exhibit, and a beautiful samurai helmet was supported by a mount that was just a little too light, and it sat and bobbed just with the vibration of the building. And there was nothing you could do about it. It just was there, and it was, it was not really a good. Also, something that even if, if you have a, a very small post on a large object that is from an engineering point of view, strong enough to support it still, sometimes that support is visually just too small and it just is it, it isn't harmonious. So those are those are little things and they're stylistic things that we also want to think about in our mount making is we want this object to feel really just nice and solid. Mounts have to be non-invasive. They have to be totally reversible. This is your basic tenet of conservation. We can't do anything to the object that we can't undo. So we can't drill into the object. We can't nail into the object. We can't glue to it. There are some exceptions, but these are usually the purview of conservation or the artists or other things. So holes are occasionally drilled into large stone sculptures for mounting posts. It's not something that you just do. It's usually with a living artist or if there's no other way to hold on to something. Um, reinforcements, Japanese, uh, Japanese tissue used to reinforce a textile, that's going to be conservation. That's not mount making. Sleeves stitched to textiles. Uh, unless you have people that are fully trained and very uh, well versed in doing that, again, I feel that's a conservation task. Sometimes we can make changes to bases and other elements. We can screw into them, but that's that's a pretty specific uh, caveat. Our mounts have to be force neutral. And this is a term I came up with to kind of think about holding an object gently, cradling it. The mount mustn't apply any distorting forces to the object. The mount should hold it loosely enough to allow the movement of it, the expansion contraction with temperature and humidity, and just you know things like rawhide, especially when I think of a, uh, a plateau plains car flesh or a quiver or something like that, they aren't really stable. And so the mount needs to have just enough room so that they can move without starting to distort. The object must never be distorted to load it into the mount. And this is one of those things that has traditionally been 
not really looked at quite as an important thing. You know, oh, you can go ahead and squeeze that a little in, into the prongs, or the mount should never be distorted to load the object into it. You can pull the prongs apart and snap them around that object. I've seen a lot of damage to objects where there are tracks, where there are scratches, and things like that. And so these are some of those things that as we've gone on with mount making, we've really tried to look at these modes of damage. And so now we use removable retention elements that may be attached to the base of the, um, the, the main structure of the mount with a screw that's drilled and tapped into the base, something like that. So we really try to keep the, the mount from being distorted to do anything we want it to just fit correctly from the get-go. Find using appropriate materials. It has to be physically gentle. No abrasion. We want, you know, to have nice soft materials always be what's in contact with the object. It has to be chemically compatible. And the ADI testing, which is a an accelerated aging test for to show off-gassing and corrosive possibilities, uh, is one of the important things that we work with, uh, the AIC site that we're working with right now, they have a wonderful materials wiki, which has uh, body test results. It is a work in progress. It's sometimes a little frustrating to uh, find things on, but is well worth it. Um, the materials need to be structurally sufficient for the task. There are some times that you can uh, want to use one thing and realize that it just doesn't have the stiffness to provide the support. So we have to think of that in our choices. And then it has to be reasonably workable. It has to be available. If you can't get something, it can't be really part of your, your toolkit. And part of that is cost. There are wonderful things. I've worked with medical plastics and stuff like that that are heat formable but they're just too expensive to be part of what we get to use. So these are all factors that we look at when we're choosing materials. So in speaking about materials and in speaking about those medical plastics, we as mount makers are scouring the industrial realm for uh, materials because there are all sorts of cool things out there. And so we look into art and science and medicine and industry and all these other places. The McMaster car catalog is one of our Bibles, huge catalog full of industrial goods. But there are some things that still come down to be the standard materials that we use. And the first one of those is brass. Brass is just such a wonderful material. It's really quite easy to work with. It cuts with fairly standard tooling, drills easily. It has moderate strength. Uh, it's not super strong, but it's strong enough to do most of what we need to do. We join it with silver brazing alloys. You'll hear them referred to as silver solder. Solders are a low temperature alloy. Silver brazing is higher temperature, and but we're able to join it together with those. So, like the mount that you see together, all of those connections are done with silver brazing alloys and a fairly straightforward torch system. And you can do amazing things with it. It's very forgiving to work with, and I just, after all these years, I just adore working with brass. It's great fun. Feel is what we use when we need higher strength. Any sorts of large mounts are almost all made of steel, and they can be uh, silver brazed, but once we get to a certain point, those are uh, fabricated with welding. Um, it's more difficult to work with than brass because it's harder, so drilling, tapping, uh, cutting are all more difficult, and so it requires more specialized tooling. But the advantages are wonderful, and the other advantage is that it's actually quite a bit cheaper than brass. Brass is rather expensive. Sheet plastics, we use a variety of plastics in mount making. Uh, I personally don't use them as much as brass. I still find brass to be the 
the overall winner, but when they're appropriate, they're great. They're a little lower strength, but they're fairly easy to work with. We can heat form uh, most plastics. Uh, so they're suited to, to kind of particular uses. They're great for uh, book mounts, and they're great for a lot of things. And they can be used in ways that we can really make very complex mounts. Uh, acrylic uh, plexiglass is what most people think of with uh, plastic mounts. It can, you know, it is clear. It can be polished. Uh, it can be bent. Uh, it is really useful in many, many ways. Vivac is a softer plastic, which is out of the sign making industry. It's uh, heat formable in a stretching. You can do a three dimensional bend with it, uh, whereas acrylic is much harder to do anything other than a simple two dimensional bend. Intra is a board that most of you will know from mounting photos on it. It's a foamed PVC. Sintra brand board tends to pass our ID tests, but a lot of the others do not. So it's something that we use just kind of in certain ways. And then Gator board is a foam core board with a phenolic reinforced paper exterior that's very hard. It's great for underlying other mounts, uh, for structural parts, and a variety of things. It's a very useful board product. And then moldable epoxy putties are something that we use a lot. Uh, and so down in the circle on the lower portion of the camel slide, that is a, uh, a setup for making a base for that camel that is, has been laid down. And I photographed it before going and covering it with a plastic saran wrap or something like that, and then squishing the uh, camel down into it. And as you look at it, it's laid out as a series of strips or kind of little snakes of this epoxy putty. And that's because it's fairly viscous. And when we press the object into it, now the epoxy putty, as it takes the shape of the underside of the object, has some place to go. It has some place to squish to. If that was a solid slab, it would place much more pressure on the object. So we're working when we're, when we're using epoxy putty, we need to be very gentle in the pressure that we're applying to the object. And so by doing it in this fashion, we're able to get a very complete support, but not stress the object. The horse on the right, if you look at the black line that's at the bottom of it, that is a shim of epoxy putty that's attached to a mount system like the seismic mount I showed earlier that goes up and into that horse. And it just gives this nice black line that has been trimmed and painted, and it forms this great plastic base. Epoxy putties, in general, uh, pass Audi tests and are mostly considered appropriate in contact with objects. If we're working with a sensitive object, we'll often paint a layer of B72 resin over it and uh, just give it a one isolation layer that way. Paddings and barriers. We use a lot of paddings. We want to be having padding on the metals or on the mount anytime it is in contact with the object when we're building the mount or when it's actually installed. So we use acrylic felt, uh, suede polyethylene, or also known as ultra suede. Those are both things that uh, are just in common use uh, and are both available through Benchmark. Uh, Benchmark is a mount making company and supplier that is in New Jersey. Uh, and excellent folks. They've been in the business for years. And the nice thing is they have felts and poly suede polyethylene that are in strips, pre-cut, and those have all been Audi tested. So those are really good for if you're working with uh, sensitive objects or in production, having the pre-cut strips is, is really useful. Heat shrink tubing we use a lot. There are PVC heat shrink tubings, which we do not use. But polyolefin is the most normal. And again, Benchmark's heat shrink tubing is more supple than others, which sometimes when you're trying to put it onto the mount is really important. PTFE or Teflon, 
tubings are a higher temperature heat shrink, uh, but they are really nice. So these are tubings that are of a larger size that you slide over something and then you heat with a heat gun and they shrink down and grip the uh, piece of rod or whatever you're putting it over. Velara is a fused service polyethylene foam. I like to use it for uh, bench padding, but then also for padding mounts. Paraloid B72, uh, you probably all know it from, you know, it's used as varnishes, it's used as coatings, it's also in thick form, it's used as an adhesive. 3M 415 and 465 are pressure sensitive adhesives that we often put on fabrics to uh, make them adhere. And so those are really nice. And with all these things, I have to totally give you the caution that Audi to current Audi testing is really necessary when you're using things with sensitive materials, as all these are commercial products and the formulations do change. And so we need to just always keep aware of it. Uh, the Audi testing. Uh, the MET has been doing a large audit testing program right now, and so I'm really hoping that it all kind of stabilizes. We use lots of foams, fabrics, ethafoam, again, Valara, polyester batting. Uh, stockinette is really useful for covering things. Uh, stretch knits, uh, like are covering those hat mounts. Uh, it's, it should be washed first, but otherwise, again, is, is generally really good. Ultra suede, I just love how ultra suede works. So there's there's a whole range of things that we use in that. I want to talk a little bit about the mount making workshop and our ways of working. This is a picture of mount making focus studio set up for one of the workshops. I feel that the object deserves a defined clean zone on the workbench. And so this, I put down a layer of Velara that is fresh and clean. And I put it down with blue tape that defines this zone that belongs to the object. We then have foam blocking or tubes of uh, Tyvek with peanuts uh, you know, uh, foam peanuts or even sand or something in it, so that you you have things that you can block up the object with. Those two pieces of foam pipe insulation that are there next to the mask, they have a nice smooth surface and they help keep the horns on that up off of the, the bench when I flip that over and it gives me a nice uh, careful support so when I go to measure and template it, it's, it's nice and stable. The tools and supplies that I'm working with, they stay on the bench itself and, and having this blue tape line gives me this, this visual thing of that's the object zone, things don't go there. We also don't tend to, when we're picking up tools, we don't ever want them to go over the object just because we do drop things. So. If they're going from one side to the other, they always try to go around the blue zone. Gloves are an important part of mount making. And I've come to have the preference for using nitrile palmed knit gloves for object handling. And I specifically like these uh, Showa or Atlas brand number 370 white assembly gloves. They have a fused nitrile palm and a knit back. Your hands don't sweat in them. And the thing about them is they're easy to take on and off. And we all know, working with disposable nitrile gloves, that you pull them off and your hands are awful. They're all yucky and you don't want to touch anything with them. So the biggest problem is, in mount making, we're going back and forth from working with the object to then working with the metal, working with the tools working with machines. And what this brings up is it's a great opportunity for cross-contamination of getting up and not wanting to take your gloves off and, oh, I'll just drill a hole. But there's a little bit of oil on the drill press, and you don't notice it, and you come back. And we've now contaminated the object with just a little bit of oil. With the nitrile palm knit gloves, 
it's easy to take them off and go to the machine with our bare hands or with another set of gloves that we put on to go do that work. And the gloves come off and they go down on the white Valara. They stay within the object zone. So once again, we're, we're keeping kind of this object zone of both what's on our hand, what's on the bench. Um, the nice thing about these gloves is that they're washable for many reuses. I'll wash them up to eight or ten times before the palms start to harden. There will be a certain point where you'll notice they'll start losing their grip. They'll also get stained a little bit. But overall, they really have the, a great ability to be used again and again and again. And so I buy them in bulk keep them and whenever I see contamination on them, I switch to a new pair and those go into the batch to be laundered. So here's my old hound dog Ida heading looking for essential tools for mountain making. I had to put her in just for a little comic relief. We use lots of hand tools. Pliers. I have more types of pliers than anybody you know. And they are my the extensions of my hands for growth uh, holding on to metal and bending things. And uh, you know, it just is really, uh, you work through and you find all these things that uh, you gradually get to know. Files, cutting tools are all part of it. We have templating tools. We have flexible curves and contour gauges, and so here, I'm taking a contour of the inside of that mask that I was showing earlier. I'm then also using a two-ply mat board to use as a way of visualizing the mount. So I'll go and I'll take that piece of mat board and I'll lay it down inside the mask. And one of the things I'm doing with it, besides just giving myself a tool for visualizing the mount, I'm using it as I lay across these odd shapes, and it helps me find where there's a simple path. There's a two-dimensional curve, not a complex curve. And that's one of the things when we're working with flat stock in brass mount making, that we want to find simple curves as opposed to complex curves so that we keep the level of complexity of the mount to a minimum. So the mat board assists with that. It also is an empirical measurement tool. I can go and lay it across, and like you can see on that bottom cross piece of mat board, the ends are cut at an angle. Those are the angles of the edge of the mask, and those are what I'm going to join my next retaining mechanisms to, and they may either screw on or they may be silver braids directly onto that. I'll take that flexible curve, and I'll chart the curve of that upper one, and then I'll go to a piece of graph paper, and I will write that, I'll trace that curve onto the graph paper, labeling it proper right, proper left, and that then gives me the ability to take my metal and bend it to that curve and not to the inside of the mask. These are techniques that are especially important when we are working with an object that we have to template the object and then go away to an, another shop to be able to actually work and build the mount. So, you know, because sometimes we're able to work with the object on our bench. Sometimes we have to go and chart and design the mount in collections and leave the object in collections and then go to the shop and work on it there. So the, the mat board templating is just the way that I've worked out to be able to do those those things, and it's it's a really useful uh, uh, technique for me. So as far as stationary tools, the ribbon sander is really the one tool that I just find I can almost not do without. Uh, so this is a one-inch belt uh, by 42-inch long for this large one. Uh, and an 8-inch disc. And this is useful for cleaning up the end of a piece of brass or a, the edge of a piece of plexiglass or kind of all these different things where we want to go and true up a, 
of a surface. That belt has a metal platen in the lower half of it, so we get a nice hard surface there. But then it isn't supported in the upper surface so that we can kind of round things up there. It's a great, great way to do the rounding for the final finish on it. The bandsaw is used to cut things to length, cut shapes out, uh, and is a very versatile saw. This one specifically is really nice because it's a two-speed saw that has a very slow speed for cutting steel. And that's something that I've wanted for years and finally was able to find at auction. Um, you'll also notice next to the sander there is a vacuum cleaner. And that vacuum is uh, set up on the sander both uh, to exhaust the, uh, the dust from the sander, but it's, it's actually connected in such a way that this is a vacuum equipped with a relay so that when you turn on the sander, it turns on the vacuum, and then the vacuum stays on for another, another couple of seconds after the sander is turned off to evacuate the hose. This is made by Fine, F-E-I-N. It's a German company, and they're wonderful. Drill press is another thing that just helps so much. You want to have it with a vise on there to control the, the metal especially, but drilling precision holes, uh, you want a drill press. To the right is a milling machine, which is like a drill press on steroids with a movable table. And this is a small, really wonderful milling machine. And I use it for slotting and for other precision drilling, lots of things. It is a great tool. Fire tables. Uh, for the classes, I have two. Um, and they are equipped with an evacuation system over it so that the fumes from the flame and from the flux especially are drawn away from the person. In this situation, it just goes out a window, uh, but it just takes it away from the operator. The torches on the right are what I use. The yellow torch is a very common plumbing torch. It is a burns -a matic or this one is a Surefire sure brand. They are a trigger start plumbing torch that uses MAP gas, which is a uh, proprietary gas mixture that comes in a yellow canister. These are available at most hardware stores in the US, and they're about 60 bucks for an outfit. They are very hot. Um, I can actually, especially with two of these, I can silver brace quarter inch steel. Uh, but you'll find one of those. We'll do all the silver brazing on brass that you can imagine. It is a fairly large physical flame, and so it takes a little bit of work to get to know it. But there's a learning curve on that. The other one is an oxygen and fuel uh, torch called a Miko Midget, which is a lovely little torch. I'm using it with propane as my fuel. That is a very hot torch and a very precise flame. It has uh, multiple tips that you can really tailor to what you want. This is a dual mite bender, uh, Oxford General Industries. Uh, it has a clamp that holds the brass and then a lever arm that you're able to make uh, really nice bends. You can see on the right, that is one inch by eighth inch steel that I'm cold bending with it and can do very pre precise and repeatable bends. There are a whole series of mandrels, so you can bend in all sorts of different sizes and uh, lots of different attachments. It's an excellent tool. Um, there are on the expensive side. Uh, there is a Chinese knockoff of it that I kind of hate to even talk about because it's a direct theft of uh, the uh, technology. Um, and uh, this is a good place for pole number two, yes. uh, the torches. I'm not paying attention to my poles. And the final things that I really feel we need in the shop are machinist vise. There's a lot of times you really need to hold on to the material for drilling and tapping and things. And then on the right, we have a heat gun, which we need for shrinking heat, shrink tubing, uh, but also for bending the acrylic. Uh, oh, okay. 
So the components of the mount making process are really mount making starts with object assessment. We have to look at the condition of the object, structural integrity, where the weight and the center of gravity are, and what the physical size is, and also the opportunities that that object gives us. So condition, the structural integrity, we're looking at fugitive surfaces, pigments, fragile edges, inherent weaknesses of the object. And then what the overall integrity is. How much are we going to have to support this? What is the robust, robustness of the object itself? What do we need to provide? We need to estimate the weight. And this is a sandstone jolly from Mughal, India that I just worked on. Uh, it had broken. And we needed to repair it and then support it, so we needed to estimate the weight of it. So what I did was look at, try to figure out how much cubic material there was, so multiply the width and depth of the whole frame area and figure out how much cubic material there was in that, and then look at the interior lattice and do the uh, the area of that and then multiply it, I did by 35%, which is what I figured was how much stone there was in there. And then add those two together to get a cubic square of you know, how much material there is. And then I multiplied that by the material weight of 145 pounds per cubic foot, which is what sandstone is. Things uh, like granite and stuff I usually think of as 160. But that gave me a, a figure of about 200 pounds for that. And that's what we needed to know, because we were going to be picking it up and everything else. Where is the center of gravity? And what is the balance of the object? So this is a template of that copper that I showed earlier. And the distribution, it's wider at the top, it's denser at the top. And so the center of gravity is where I put that cross. It's up higher. So that's where I'm going to need to attach the mount to it. And I want to attach the mount just above the center of gravity so that there is more weight below it. You get pendulous weight, and it makes it all stable. The closer to the center of gravity we are, the more you are able to rotate it, uh, and the weight stays even. But this center of gravity is something that we really need to look at. And most of the time, when we're working with objects, they're a size that we can pick up, but a lot of times you're estimating where that is. Uh, and then the size and actual weight of the object are what are going to determine the strength and stiffness of the structure that's holding it up. So this copper has a really large socket on the back wall and a piece of, I think, one inch uh, stock that is the post that is holding it to the wall and then a large socket on the back of the mount. So all of those things were determined by how heavy the object was. Uh, often with a heavier object, you also want to use two uh, posts. And so those are the decisions that we're making when we're planning our mount. And then we want to look at the opportunities. This is a dodo bird circus wagon ornament. Um, and it happened to have. Uh, a whole mounting system from when it was on the circus wagon. And so we were able to use some of those holes and the things that were already attached because they were nice and sound and, and you know really well seated. But a lot of the time, we we're looking for where can we reach around it? Where can we take the weight of the object? And then we need to identify a method to capture that object. And so a set of retained or grabbers that come around the top. And they have to be in opposition to that thing on the other side, that weight bearing below you can oppose with the grabber above. So the object can't kind of sneak out of the mount. And then sufficient contact surface is important for proper support. So a lot of mounts are made from round stock, whether it's rod or wire. This is best for things that are lighter or are very sturdy, because 
a round contour like that has just one line of contact. It doesn't have a great area to spread load. I tend to like flat stock for my mounts because it has a greater bearing surface that the load can fall on, but they're both really useful. Round stock is nice because you can bend it in multiple directions really easily, where flat stock really is best for simple dimensional contours, simple bends. I throw this in because this is a mask that I just saw. It is, sadly, it has insufficient surface area and the fit isn't very good and I just made me notice it. Obviously from all the insect damage, it's a very compromised piece, but there in the circle you can see one of the two prongs that take all the weight. And that prong isn't contacting me except it's back on the very corner. I would be worried that when this would come off display, there'd be a very small dent back there from taking that weight. Luckily, it's a fairly light object, so it still may be OK. But if that prong was bent up just a little bit, it now would be in contact, and you would get much more weight bearing out of it. You also wouldn't notice it nearly as much, because you see that space between the prong and the object, and it makes you notice it. Receiver systems are something that I've actually written on for the Journal of the American Institute of Conservation. And receiver systems are just some sort of fitting that can go on the mount that then mates to the support structure that goes to the deck or to the wall. And the nice thing is that a receiver allows you different ways of installing the object. With the socket that is in the middle of this mask mount, I can install this on a post going down to the deck, or I can have a post coming back to the wall with a slight upward turn that that socket's onto. And then there's a set screw, an Allen-headed screw that tightens against the post and firms up that, uh, that connection. The nice thing about it is that by not having a post on it that has to be put into the wall, with the mount on it, we aren't putting the object onto the mount while it's in position in the case and having to actuate some little screw or do something. And we're not having to put the post into the wall while the object is on the mount. Uh, and I've seen that many a time. This allows us to put the mount onto the object on a nice padded bench where we have control of everything, put the connecting uh, post to the wall or to the deck, and then bring the two together and easily put them together, actuate the set screw, and everything is nice and secure. Uh, ideally, what I want is I'll put that post in the deck. I'll be able to bring the object over to it, connect it to it, and without even tightening the set screw, I can take my hands away because it is stable. It is not going to fall over. And then I tighten the set screw and it makes it all firm and solid. So this is a method that I have come to really believe in as being a major safety method when it comes to installation. The other thing about it is that not only does it make your installation easier, it makes deinstallation very fast. And this is important in an emergency situation. I've been watching the fires in California, and I would think that if I had a fire coming at my museum, well, one, you save yourself, people first. But having receiver systems to be able to deinstall de really precious things would be really useful. And then there's aesthetic tactics. Uh, we want to work in the visual shadow, uh, put things behind the object, make it so that we really can't see the what all is going on. Uh, give things slippery shapes. I like to make the ends of my, my mount holders that are in visual the visual zone to be kind of rounded so that the eye slides off them. We work to harmonize those pieces with the contours of the object. And then I'll usually paint uh, the mount to be a neutral color that will go with it, go with the object so that it doesn't draw the eye. I don't 
favor painting out the object to where it is, you know, like if there's a stripe on the object, I don't paint a stripe on the mountain because I don't want it to be mistaken for a part of the object. I just want you to just look at it and go, oh yeah, that's the mount, and look at the object. So that's where I say it's better to be a matter of fact than a little too tricky on your mount. So this is a quick case study of the Yupik whale mask. Here we go and we assess the weight and balance, the condition, the desired position, and the aesthetics, the opportunities, and then the needs of the object. Here I show the templating with the mat board. We take con contours with the soft rulers, profile gauges. Again, we try to work with simple curves. The mat board has shown me where I can lay down those curves where I'm not getting a twist. I want the, the design path to be as simple and as straightforward as possible. And then I'm looking ahead for what I'm going to need to do. So like the two vertical members on the sides, those are there so that I can attach the pieces that will hold up the little flippers and hands. Then I build the center part, and then we go and build and connect the exterior uh, grabbers. Again, we build from the mat board template. We confirm the contours as we go and bend. Any time that the metal is going to come in contact with the object to, make, to confirm a curve, it has to be padded. And I always walk around and try to let my fingers feel the mountain, make sure there aren't any sharp edges. I want to just make it so that I just don't have the possibility of scarring the object. I don't bend metal while it's in contact with the object. And this is the problem with like T mounts and stuff, is people tend to bend them around an object. I've seen denting, I've seen scraping. So it's just a rule, you don't bend metal while it's in contact with the object. And then we design and fit the, the additional elements as they're needed. And here, there's the a holder for the little beluga whale that's being eaten by the larger whale. And that goes on with a screw. And there's the quill and, uh, or the fin and hand holders to support those original quill attachments. And so we've got the happy whale. Um, and this might be a good time for the third poll. Of, uh, have you ever built an object mount before? And then finally, I want to give a quick word on mount documentation. And this is something that doesn't happen enough, but mounts are often installed by the person other than the mount maker. And they also often require a specific sequence of assembly. The main part goes in with a little twist and a little go around. And what we've realized is that in the days now of cell phone cameras and everything, ideally, if we take just a, a 10, 20 second clip of how this goes together, that could actually be downloaded and included in the accession records for use in future installation or just in the installation of the objects. More and more we see there being an iPad or a Microsoft Surface or something else that's part of the installation process. And this would be really useful. Also, just a basic paper template of the object, just the footprint visually that can be taped to the wall that we can say, OK, there's where the post goes. That facilitates the installation. It's also a good place to put pertinent details on. And that can be included with the mount. So mount documentation is something well worth doing. A few final mount examples. This is a actually a plexiglass base mount that holds the octopus bag, and it goes down to the support post that's holding up the, the ermine parka. This is the Alaska State Museum. Acrylic blade with nylon line that's just a very simple stabilizer for the vessel on the left. On the right, there's a dual-bladed support mount that is really a much better capture and is truly a seismic stabilization measure. Here we've got, again, this acrylic mount for this very high gloss object on an offset base. And this is a real example of how you're harmonizing the material with the material of the object. The brightness of the uh, 
the light gathering of the plexiglass doesn't work well with dull objects, but with a shiny object, it gets lost in the shine. The other thing I like is that the offset base disassociates that support from the object. It lets the object come forward, and you get a real emphasis of the object. Here's a subtle support. It's hard to see, but it runs up from the base, up along the rim of the bucket, up the left hand support to the top, and hooks that top handle. And this holds the handle up, which would flop down, and takes a little bit of weight, and but gives it a really nice aesthetic without showing very much. So this is both preservation and aesthetic effect. Our hat mounts with carved out the foam and batting with fabric coverings uh, are a real normal thing. I have included in the handout a very new design for a hat mount from Becky Doonan, who is a conservator in the Netherlands that was just presented at the Mount Making Forum in London that uses stockinette stuffed with uh, polyester batting and then threaded uh, thread that's, that's gone through around that can be tightened and change the shape and the size of it. It's a groundbreaking mount. And uh, so look at those and think about that sort of way of building mounts and what we can do with it, because you are all going to be part of building the next wave of mounts. Here's a Texel mount using magnets that are embedded in a gator foam board that mounts the wall. On the right, the two black lines, those are the uh, gator foam and magnet board padded with ultra suede, as well as a piece of steel padded with ultra suede. The steel goes on the front of the object. The magnets go on the back. It gives a very even support to the object. It pinches it along a great uh, length of it, and uh, the uh, the nice thing is it's very easy to put up and easy to take down, very kind of the object. And occasionally, we get mounts that imitate art. This is one I did a number of years ago for this Moche Peru ceramic vessel. It's great fun to have it, and I Still, it's the most sculptural thing I've probably ever made. And with that, we finish this. Thank you for participating. And now we can talk about uh, the uh, questions that have come up. Um, and so I'm looking in the parking lot of questions. And one is, do I know a good source of archival gray black at the foam? And I do not. Um, I have gotten at the phone from a local packaging place that is black, and I have no idea if it's archival. Um, Rebecca Fury asks, can you explain more about how I attach the support to the back of the whale mask? The back of the whale mask has a socket uh, that is brazed on that is a 3 8 inch outside diameter socket uh, or piece of brass tubing that uh, has an 049 inch wall, which the secret to that is it's under a 16th of an inch so that the interior dimension is slightly larger than a quarter inch. So the 049 wall tubings are kind of my secret for uh, receivers. It gives you that ability to have a nice socket that a standard size post will fit in and just enough room for the, uh, the set screw to actuate. Um, the jumping horse at the beginning was attached with two very simple posts. That was a very early mount, actually, in my career. Uh, the cost of making mounts is hard to kind of talk about, um, because it's really uh, kind of a, well, it's an experience thing as to how fast you can do it. It's a time of building mounts can be difficult. Um, materials I don't find are all that expensive.
expensive in building mounts um, because we don't use that much, but uh, uh, that's a hard one to answer. I don't, I don't really have a good uh, thing for that, a, a good answer for you on that. Uh, Rebecca Lando Hernandez, have you ever done workshops on the receiver systems and disaster recovery? No, I haven't. Sounds like it would be a great idea because I feel that it's a really useful uh, uh, useful thing. Um, the article that I wrote on receivers was part of a special issue of the Journal of the American Institute for Conservation. And I've been meaning to put it up on my website, which is mountmakingfocus, all one word, dot com. And I will try to get that onto the website over the next week, because it's, it's a worthwhile uh, article to read. The entire special issue on mount making is currently in the process of trying to be put online through the, I believe, the wiki site at the foundation of the AIC. Um, Shelley Uller, who is the mount maker from the Museum of the American Indian, uh, has talked about working on that. Uh, so we will see uh, if that gets out there pretty soon. Uh, uh, Jamie, there... uh, I'm not sure if you answered the second part of Lauren's question about uh, did you ever reuse mounts or parts of mounts for different objects? Ah, thank you. Um, so yep. I didn't answer very much the second half of Lauren Poston's uh, question on reusing mounts. Um, mounts are a very individual thing. There are some things that are standard enough that you can reuse parts, and so especially mounts that are made for, say, plates, or uh, we had an entire mount system that we made for garments like kimonos when we were at Seattle Art Museum. And those are easy to reuse. Um, reusing materials, uh, I have cut up old mounts and repurposed them just to save materials. But as far as um, reusing the actual mount, it really depends on how custom uh, that mount has to be made to the individual object. Um, so it, it can be done, but it's uh, definitely a, a somewhat, you know, it, it's a very individual sort of thing uh, to be able to reuse uh, a mount. Um, now, the support systems, the posts and everything, are definitely reused. And once a mount is made for an object, it should be part of the, uh, of basically what goes with the object, because there's no point in ever remaking a mount that is well done. So uh, I know at Seattle Art Museum in the session records, there was a field for not only the location of the object, but the location of the mount. Uh, and that, I feel, is really important. Uh, Jamie, not to make a comment, uh, it's something I've always kind of uh, 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 understood, being uh, coming from background packing. Uh, it seems like mount making has a lot of similarities to just basic packing, you know, when it comes to uh, selecting the strong points of, of contact to an object, uh, providing support and protection against vibration. It just seems like it's a more in-depth, kind of in-tune process, but a very similar process to what a packer does to handle an object. Um, I, I, I think that's very true. Um, all of these things, whether it's the, the handling, the packing, the transport, they're all really looking at the object in you know what its needs are. You know how much support this needs. Where can we grab it? And mount making is kind of the aesthetic end of it. And of course, we have 
storage mount uh, that don't need to look pretty, and then we have the mounts that we're putting on display that we want to be more discreet, but they all still have to follow the same set of, of protocols as to holding on, gently taking care of this uh, thing. For traveling exhibits, there are definitely things that we'll do slightly different uh, if, you know, and this is where the receivers again come into their own to be able to use the mount in a variety of different fashions. We have built mounts that have actually become part of the securing of the object in the shipping system. This can work very well, but it also uh, can transmit more vibration to the object, so it's something that we use in a very advised manner. Uh, but you know, this is where I like to emphasize that a mount is an idea. A mount is a set of criteria that we're working to meet and that we're able to put in all sorts of purposes into our mount making. And so I'm, I'm really happy to be able to kind of spread the gospel of mount making as it is to be able to just harness the brain power of all of you. Uh, I hope that this has given you a little look and that you're you're fascinated uh, with it because to me this is a, a professional puzzle solving uh, discipline in our uh, in our work life and I just I really enjoy it um, I have actually just taken a, a job with the well, with Pacific Studios which is uh, a commercial operation that is doing the exhibits for the Burke Museum in Seattle, and so I'm going to be building uh, mounts for the Burke uh, collection over the past over the next about eight months. And so I won't be doing as many uh, workshops during that time, but I should still be doing some. You can uh, keep track of them by going to the website mountmakingfocus.com. Uh, and the announcement should be there. There is one workshop coming up uh, December 4th through 7th that still has a couple of places uh, in it, and you can check it out there. You also mentioned gonna, the, uh, go ahead, Susan. I'm going to put up the evaluation link. This is the evaluation for the whole course, and. Uh, we'd really appreciate it if you take the time and fill it out. I'll also post it in the education website, uh, but please fill it out. We, they're very important to us. We learn a lot from them. What I was going to say was that you had mentioned earlier, uh, Jamie, the International Mail Making Forum. Uh, they just had it in, in London uh, in September. But every other year they have it in the U.S., is that correct? So the Mount Making Forum is a every other year conference that uh, started, uh, first one was at, at, the, uh, or, uh, at the Getty, second was at the Smithsonian, third was at the Field Museum. Uh, the one in London that happened in September was the first time it has gone outside of the U.S. Uh, it is possible that the next one could be, well, I think the next one is probably going to be back in the US. There's possibilities of Salt Lake City. Um, and uh, so uh, we'll try to get announcements out for that. The Pack-In Forum is an excellent place for announcements of that. Also, there is a Mount Making Forum online, which is, I think, a Google group. Um, and uh, I can try to get links to that. Um, I do want to also look and, and uh, answer Tom Doyle's question. Have you ever used wood for making the base of a mount in a case? I believe that birch wood is sometimes used since it does not off-gas as much. Yes, uh, wood can be used. Uh, wood is 
not used really as a mount making material all that much because all wood products do give off organic acids, but it is an appropriate thing at times. Birch is an excellent wood because it is very dry, has very little in the way of uh, extractives that are part of it. Poplar would be another one that is used in that way, and alder is also quite dry. But overall, we don't tend to use it very much, uh, although casework is still made mostly of like metite 2, which is a formaldehyde-free uh, uh, board material. Uh, but as the ID tests become more and more important, we continue to go away from wood products in exhibits at all. And uh, so it hasn't been really a part of mount making for quite a while. Um, I, I just want to remind you of, of a couple of things. I need to get all of your assignments by November 26th. And if, if you're not going to, you're not aiming to get the Credly badge, it doesn't matter. And I may contact some people to ask them uh, if that's their intention is to not do anything, uh, which is fine. Um, and I will also see if I can get the FAIC receiver systems article, and I'll post it in the handouts if I can. And I'll see if I can post the special issue on mount. And what else? Ah, we have two upcoming free webinars um, in connecting to collections care. In two weeks, there's one on plastics and caring for plastics that might be of interest. And um, in the middle of December, we have one on crating objects. So that should be of interest to you, too. So. Uh, go to our website. You can click on the picture in the uh, in the slides that roll by, and you can sign up. And that'd be fine. Those are free. Are there any more questions? Tim is typing some. Um, no more questions. But I want to say thank you for participating in this. Um, course, we really <laughs> appreciate it. This is the first time we've done a course, and uh, so we've been happy with how it's gone. And I want to thank Mark, who's been my comrade in doing this as the course coordinator. And I want to thank Jamie for giving a lovely uh, talk today. And um, I believe, and I will check this out, that if you're registered for this course, that you have access to the webinars and stuff as much as you want. And I'll make sure that that's the case. And if it is, I will let you know. Um, and I think that's it. Do you have anything to say, Mark or Jamie? Well, I'd like to just thank nope. Jamie for a wonderful presentation today, and, uh, as well as all the other speakers that we've had the last couple of weeks. Uh, uh, it's been, I think, a very in-depth uh, for the various topics, and I hope everybody appreciated the amount of uh, information and resources that people provided to you, and I hope that benefits you and your your role in your institution. Uh, that's what it's all about. And I'd like to thank Susan and AIC for providing all this. This has been a, a great opportunity. They have a pool some really talented uh, uh, people together to be able to share their knowledge um, in a given field. So thank you, Susan. Thank you. And, I, and we really appreciate being able to par a partner with Packin. Uh, that's, that's been really wonderful for us, so thank you. And, um, you're welcome. We want to thank Mike Morneau. He's been our producer. He's faithful there behind the scenes making sure everything goes well, and we want to thank him. Um, yes. Please fill out the um, evaluation form. And as I said, I will try to post it also in the education website so that you can, uh, if you don't get it here, you can get it there. And remember, November 26th, uh, we turn into pumpkins. And so have a nice Thanksgiving. And uh, thank you very much. And 
we hope that you'll join us in some of our free webinars. We're going to have some courses next year. Uh, there's going to be one on storage. Your program, probably. Uh, we also have some things coming up next year on microclimates. That will be in January. So keep an eye on the website, and you'll find things. And we also have lots and lots of resources on our website, so you can always go there. So thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all. I've really enjoyed working with you, and uh, thanks for all